Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you at this time thanking you for blessing us with another day, for allowing us to come here this morning during this hour to open your word and to study from it. And we pray, Father, that every time we open your word that we will lift the pages, lift the words off the pages of, of your book and into our hearts and that we will apply them to our lives and that we will not be ashamed to take it out into this world to teach others your will and to be a, an example to those in this world. We ask that you be with those of our number who are physically sick at this time, that you will return them to their good health, allow them to be back with us once again. But we also pray for the ones who are spiritually sick, that they will come to realize the sin in their life and that they will make things right before it's too late. We ask that you go with us throughout not only this Bible study hour, but through our worship hour, that everything we do this morning will be pleasing to you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to change things up a little bit today. Um, Caleb had started uh, a study on the Gospel of John. Um, I'm going to let him pick that back up. You know, we covered John chapter 6, the rest of John chapter 6 on Wednesday, but I'll let him pick up with John chapter 7. Um, he said he was supposed to be back this Wednesday, um, but uh, we will uh, we'll affirm that and, and see if he will be here. If, if not, we'll, um, we'll uh, teach something else, but I'm going to leave John chapter 7 uh, for him. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 23 this morning, Psalm 23. <clears throat> this is something that I think everybody in this room right now is familiar with this passage. And I've said this before, it's like a passage like John 3.16. And it's one of those passages that we know very, very well. And we know it so well that I think sometimes we just kind of overlook it, we don't think about it anymore because we know what it says and we move on. And we don't take a look deeper into into the, the chapter. The 23rd Psalm is actually a message for fast track 21st century lives. It speaks specifically to the living surrounded by the pressures of our time and our culture and our world. So let's listen to these words. It's only six verses long. <clears throat> let's listen to what it says, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Over 200 times in Scripture, God's people are called sheep. We're sheep. That's what we are called. But have you ever thought why we are called sheep? Why is it that we are called sheep? You ever wonder why God keeps using that analogy over and over again? Again, 200 times. Because when you think about the magnitude of his creation, when you think about the magnitude of the animal kingdom, think about how many animals are out there in this world. <clears throat> he could have called us eagles. He could have called us lions. He could have called us tigers. He could have called us elephants. He could have called us horses. He could have called us a number of things. But he calls us sheep over 200 times. And maybe the reason is because God knows that sheep can only survive if they follow what? The leader. The leader. The shepherd. That's exactly right. Sheep cannot survive unless they have a shepherd. They can't survive on their own. 
So let's take a few minutes and let's just talk about sheep for, for just a minute. Some of you may have grown up on a farm. Some of you may have, have experience with sheep, Charlie. Yeah, so you understand what I'm talking about. You know, when I grew up, I had friends that lived on farms, but I grew up in the city. And so I lived in a subdivision where there was a house next to a house next to a house. We had a backyard, and that was about it. We had dogs and cats running around, but I didn't see any sheep running around our neighborhood. Um, but again, <clears throat> I grew up not knowing too much about sheep. But there's three things over the years that I have learned about sheep. Number one, sheep are not the brightest of animals. They're pretty dumb. <laughs> they are. I mean, they're not the brightest of animals. Uh, when I worked at, at Disney, I trained rhinos. I trained lions. I trained the tigers. I have trained the pigs. I even helped train crocodiles. But there's one animal that you can't seem to train, and that's a sheep. You can't do it. Now, again, they're not very bright. Now, you can make your own personal application about that, but I'm not the brightest individual <laughs> by far. I'm not very bright. That's why I need a shepherd. I need a shepherd because I'm a sheep, and let's face it, we all do dumb things. We all do dumb things. I need someone to keep calling me back. But then number two, when you think about sheep, sheep are dirty. They're dirty. <clears throat> Cats, what do they do? They lie around, they lick themselves, right? They clean themselves off. Dogs do that too. Sheep don't do that. Sheep don't lie around licking themselves, cleaning themselves off, and so they're dirty and they're smelly. And so they need someone to come along behind after them and, and clean up after them. That's why they need a shepherd. But then third, sheep are defenseless. What defense mechanism do sheep have? Anybody know? <laughs> yeah, that's about it, right? They don't. They don't have a, a defense mechanism. Most animals have a way of protecting themselves from the predator. Something that provides them protection. Not sheep, they don't, they don't have anything. They can't bark, they can't emit some obnoxious odor that, that gets the predators to go away. They can't use claws because they don't have any claws. They are absolutely defenseless. Who protects them? The shepherd. The shepherd is the one that protects them. Now, the Super Bowl is next week. And we have the Kansas City Chiefs versus the San Francisco 49ers. And so we see when we look at our sports teams, when you look at our schools, when you look at not only high schools and college, but in the pros, we name our, our mascots after something that is all about roughness and toughness. And so we name our teams like the 49ers, the Chiefs, you know, the Dolphins. Dolphins are not, you know, we, we think they're nice, but they can be pretty mean. That's why sharks are afraid of them, <laughs> you know. The Vikings, the Buccaneers, you know, all of these teams have these rough and tough names. The Tigers, the Detroit Lions. The Chicago Bears, the Jaguars. So again, we want a name that epitomizes toughness. And so schools and professional teams and colleges choose from a host of animals that do that. But I challenge you to look up to see if there is a school out there known as the Fighting Sheep. You're probably not going to find it. You're not going to find, you know, here comes... The University of Fighting Sheep. It's just not going to happen. Um, and, and so they're, they're weak. They're not tough at all. And they're, and they're pretty defenseless. And so when you look at the 23rd Psalm, there's something in this Psalm that I think we miss. 
David is writing this psalm. But he's not writing it from his perspective. Did you notice that? He's writing it from the sheep's perspective. And so picture yourself as a sheep resting on the grass, surrounded by plenty of water, plenty of grass. You're relaxing in the meadow, and you look up, and the first thing you see is the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, the first thing I think about when I read that is everybody has a shepherd. Everybody does. <clears throat> Everyone has someone or something that tends to rule or, or dominate their life. Some people, it's money is their shepherd. Some people, it's success or a hobby. It may be social status of some sort. With others, it might be recognition of some kind, but everybody does have a shepherd that they follow. This sheep looks and says, the Lord is my shepherd. And you know, not everybody can say that. Not everybody can say, the Lord is my shepherd. And there's a lot of people who know about this shepherd. They know about him, but they don't know him. You see, there's a big difference. There's a big difference in knowing about the shepherd versus knowing the shepherd. And so if you're walking as a Christian in a relationship with Jesus, and you can say in verse 1 that the Lord is my shepherd, and the truth is, you know this shepherd, and guess what? The shepherd knows you. He knows you. John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. You see, when David is writing the 23rd Psalm, sheep from various flocks would intermingle with one another. And that happens even today over in those parts of the world. There's no fences. This is open pasture grazing. And so shepherds sometimes would get together, and they would talk with each other. And, well, what would happen is the sheep would all get intermixed with each other. And so the question becomes, how could the shepherds, <clears throat> when you've got hundreds of sheep, how can the shepherd get theirs out of the mix? Well, it's rather simple. When the shepherd was ready to move, the shepherd would simply just call out to the sheep. They would call out to the sheep who had been with him for such a long time that when the sheep heard the sound of his voice, they would follow. So it doesn't matter if you had three or four shepherds all talking to each other. You know, if I was one of the shepherds and I was ready to go and I called my sheep, guess who would follow? My sheep, not theirs, mine. Because they would know my voice. They would hear my voice and they would follow. And Jesus draws upon that analogy. And so the question becomes, how do we hear the shepherd's voice today? Well, he speaks to us through his word. He calls us through scripture. His direction for our lives is outlined for us in Holy Spirit-inspired words. So the question is, we hear his voice, are we going to follow 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. He calls us through his word. And those who are his sheep are going to do more than just hear his voice. Many people can hear what he has to say. A lot of people do hear what he has to say. But we as Christians, we hear and then we do what? Follow. We follow. And for good reason. Our shepherd is going to take us where we need to go. The shepherd's going to keep you on the right trail. And all along the way, all along the trail, he's going to, he's going to take care of you. He provides the things that you need. And the rest of the 23rd Psalm is, is about how he does that. 
and what he provides for you. And so when you look at verse 2, you see where he provides rest along this trail. Notice he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. No and Eli are old enough now, but when they were little, it was tough because they did not want to take a nap. They did not want to take a nap. And I would try to get them to take a nap, and they just refused. And they didn't want to. And the thing is, is they would claim that they would never be tired. They're never tired. Both Noah and Eli, they would be like dragging across the room, eyes half open. I'm like, are you tired? Mm -mm. Nope. Why do you think they said that? Because you guys knew you were going to be taking a nap, right? <laughs> That's why. And, and children just don't like to take a nap. And, and I kept telling them, you need to take your naps now because the day is going to come where you're going to want one and you're not going to get one. I would love to take a nap every day. I would love if, if my job would say, you know, take 30 minutes to just take a power nap. I would love that. But it doesn't happen. You see, kids seem to hate naps. Parents, on the other hand, man, we would love them. We would love them. But sheep are like kids. Sheep are like kids. They're not going to admit that they're tired. They're not going to admit that they need the rest. And so in verse 2, he makes me lie down. Have you ever just made your kids lie down? Did you ever just make them lie down? You know, that sounds so mean. So why did you do that? Did you do it to be mean? No. You did that because you understand that rest is good for them. Rest is what they need. And that's what our shepherd does for us. Sometimes he makes us lie down. Sometimes he, he forces us to slow down. Because we are living in a time where we are just go, 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 go. And he says to us, nope, you need to lay down. You need to rest. You need to slow down because he sees us get so busy. He sees us get so overcommitted. He sees his people getting caught up in, in, in the rat race out there. And so our priorities start getting all out of whack. We may be focused on God, but now we become busy here and there. We've got all these things that we start losing time with God. We start our prayers. Maybe we pray three times a day, but now we're so busy it drops down to two. And now we get, get more busy, it drops down to one. And then before you know it, we're going to bed at night thinking, man, I didn't even pray today. Sometimes he makes us lie down. <clears throat> Sometimes he'll use an event. He may use a circumstance. You know, it could, be, it could be a financial setback that he allows to happen. It could be a sickness that he allows uh, to happen. He'll use something that will get your attention. He will use something to get your attention, and he'll make you lie down. And like a child, we'll resist. We may put up a little bit of a fight, but he makes us lie down because he understands that when we get up, we're going to be the better for it. Psalm 46 and verse 10. Be still and know what? I am God. Be still and know that I am God. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know, sometimes we look at, at life and we look at all the circumstances and, you know, we, we might say, well, my grass doesn't look very green. All I see in my life right now is the ugly brown dead grass. Where, where's this green grass? Where's the pasture that this verse is talking about. So we start to think that maybe the shepherd has abandoned us, or maybe that he doesn't care anymore. Well, again, that's just simply not true. Now, that's just one of those lies of Satan. What David is telling us is that you've got to trust the shepherd. You've got to stay with the shepherd. You've got to stay on the trail, because sometimes... The shepherd will lead his sheep through the brown. And he will lead his sheep through the barren in order to take them to the green. Again, that still happens today over in that part of the world. Things haven't changed when it comes to shepherding. Things haven't changed when it comes to sheep. 
And so we have to stay with the shepherd. And we'll find our rest. And then at the end of verse 2, he says, He leads me beside quiet waters. Our shepherd is a leader. It's interesting, when you, when you look at our view here in America, we look at driving. We look at driving cattle. You know, you see those cowboys. They're, they're behind the cattle, and they're driving them. They're forcing them to go where they want them to go. And, and, and so that is completely different <clears throat> than what the, the, the shepherding and, and people that are shepherds. It's complete opposite of what they know. They would never dream of forcing their sheep to go places. I looked it up. There was a show. Many of you might remember the show Rawhide. It was an old TV show. And I like the theme song to it. Um, and I've seen an episode or two. But, it, you know, it's kind of rough. It's a rough and tough song with an orchestra. And at just the right moment, you hear the crack of the whip. And the song says, keep them rolling, rolling, rolling. Though the strings are swollen, keep them doggies rolling, rawhide. And so the next verse says this. No time to understand them. Just ride and rope and brand them. Keep them doggies rolling, rawhide. Doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? <laughs> if you're a cattle, you know, the crack of the whip and just keep them going, keep them moving, keep pushing them. Again, we don't have a shepherd like that. Nor would a, a shepherd, even in this day and time, dream of doing that to their sheep. Our shepherd has taken the time to understand us. In fact, he came to this earth. He left heaven itself to come to this earth to be among us. He knows what it's like to be a sheep. And so as a result, he doesn't, he doesn't drive us. He's not forcing us to do anything. He leads us. Again, the eastern shepherd would have no comprehension uh, of this raw <clears throat> this driving. Shepherds walk behind, or they don't walk behind the sheep. They walk in front of the sheep. They are out in front. You see, we're not on a sheep drive. Jesus isn't driving any of us. He's leading us. <clears throat> so again, when it, how can we apply this to our lives? Well, when, when we're worried about something in our life, we have concerns about things in our life. Jesus is not way back there somewhere. When we're worried, when we're concerned about things, he's already out in front of us. He's already been there. He's leading us. You know, when you have a surgery that's coming up, and, and, and maybe that's on your mind a lot, again, Jesus isn't way back there saying, you're going to get through it. Let me lead you through it. Maybe you're worried about test results. Again, Jesus is out in front of that situation. Maybe you're worried about your job. Maybe you're worried about your kids or your family. Again, no matter what it is, Jesus is out in front. He's not behind us pushing us. He's leading. And that's why we can feel secure, because he's leading the way. But notice it says, he leads me beside the quiet waters. Did you know sheep are afraid of running water? You don't see sheep going down to the river where it's running and, and drinking from the river. They don't go near it. They're, they're deathly afraid of running water. And you would be too if you were wearing that heavy wool coat. Because if you fall in, <laughs> you ain't coming back. And so the good shepherd, knowing this, knowing that his sheep are afraid of that, does anybody know what the shepherd does? Take them to still waters. If there's no still waters, what they will do is they will actually take rocks and build up rocks and take water from the rushing water and put it in there and lead his sheep to that water so that they can have still water to drink from. Again, he's taking care of his sheep. But he takes them beside the quiet waters. 
Now, we're just like all of them. We get into a situation and, and we panic. We panic and fear takes over and anxiety takes over. And, and we're like those sheep standing by that rushing water. And we say to ourselves, why doesn't God do something? Where is he? Why doesn't God calm the waters? Well, he will. But in whose time? His time. It's hard for us to understand. And it's hard for us to understand because we want everything in our time, right? We order food, right? We order pizza. And it says it's going to be there at 7.30. What are we doing at 7.30? Hello? Where's the food? We want it, we want it at 7.30, right? We want everything on our time. We want people to do, you know, whatever it is on our time. Well, again, we have to do things in his time. His time, not ours. He'll do things in his time. So he leads me beside quiet waters. And then it says he restores my soul. There's refreshment that is provided by this shepherd. Sheep need restoration because they tend to, to stray away. They tend to, to go away. Sheep can be strong-willed and they wander off from the safety of the shepherd. And so when that happens, the shepherd must restore them to the right path. And so every evening, every evening the shepherd will count his sheep to make sure they're all there. And I don't know if that's where the, you know, to help you fall asleep count, count sheep came from. But that's what they do. Every evening they will count the sheep to make sure that they're all there. And if one is missing, if one sheep is missing, Luke chapter 15, what does he do? He goes out and looks for the one. He goes and looks for the one that is gone. And if the same sheep, if that same sheep keeps wandering off all of the time, becomes a problem sheep. The, the shepherd will actually pick up that rebel sheep and he'll do something with him. He might know what he does. Hmm? They don't need it. He cripples it. He will break the leg of that sheep. And we look at that and we're like, oh, that's cruel. You know, Peter would have, you know, be furious with that. Like, how, how could you? That's so cruel <clears throat> that you would break the leg of that sheep. Well, this is what one writer said about that. He said, to break the leg of a poor, defenseless sheep seems vicious unless you understand the shepherd's heart. And then you realize what seems to be cruelty is an act of mercy. For the shepherd knows the sheep must stay close to him to be protected from danger. So he breaks the leg not to hurt him, but to save him, to remind him, stay close to me. That's pretty powerful. A shepherd will break the leg of their sheep. Not because they're mad at them, not because they're irritated and frustrated. It's so you will stay close. I'm trying to protect you. And I thought about that. And I thought sometimes the only way that God can restore my soul is to just break my leg. No pun intended. <laughs> sometimes that's the only way God can restore my soul and, and God will do that he will do that he will break your leg as it were he'll break your heart he'll get your attention I think we've all been there I think we can all look back and think of a time where you know, we were hurt our legs were broken your broken leg may be a job reversal, it may be your health, it could be financial issues. But again, God is going to teach us a lesson. And the lesson he's trying to teach us, according to verse 3, is stay with me. Stop going off, trying to do your own thing. Stay with me. And again, like sheep, we're stubborn. We are. 
We keep wandering off, and God says, I've got to do something. I've got to do something to get your attention. I've got to do something so that you won't keep doing that. I've got to do something so that you learn to stay close to me and trust me so that I can take care of you. I know for a fact God has broken my leg, and I'm sure he's broken many of yours. So the old saying, God cannot use you greatly until he has broken you completely. Broken legs are painful. (laughs) They hurt. But there's a reason. Somebody said that it's better to walk with a limp and follow the shepherd than to strut like a fool headed down the wrong trail. I think that's exactly right. God breaks us sometimes because he loves us. But then when you get to verse 4, when you get to verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. How many times has this psalm been used to comfort a grieving family? Somebody who's lost a loved one. And it's a very appropriate section of scripture in that setting. And yet the valley of the shadow of death is much broader than that. It's so much more broader than that. The Hebrew word could reference for, uh, for us all the dark and troublesome times of life. It could be translated, even though I walk through the valley of the deepest darkness of life. Now certainly death is a very deep valley, but it's not the only deep valley. There's other canyons that are equally dark that we're going to have to pass through. But the point is, whatever we face in our life, Whatever canyon you have to traverse, the shepherd is going to go with you. And that's what makes things so different. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, shadow means darkness. And none of us like to be in the dark. You know, maybe when we were little kids, you know, we always had to have a light on. Maybe, maybe those of us who have kids and grandkids, that's how they are. They need to have a light on. And so there would be, you know, maybe a night light that would turn on so that we would not be in complete darkness because children by nature are afraid of the dark. And I've got news for you, so are their parents. Parents are afraid of darkness too. But we're afraid of a different kind of darkness. We're afraid of the dark circumstances of life that begin to cloud and shadow our days when we begin to realize, when we hit that point, that we realize that a lot of what happens to us is out of our control. Most things in our lives are out of our control. Again, at the point when you're in the dark, you're without a point of reference. When you're in the dark, you don't know where you are. When you're in the dark, you lose your perspective. You lose your direction, and so you're hesitant. You're hesitant to take another step forward. Why? Why? Because you're unsure. Am I standing on solid ground, or am I fixing to walk off the edge? That's darkness. And so we find ourselves sometimes with very dark and shadowy and and, and foreboding circumstances. Psalmist says, you do not have to be afraid. And the reason that we do not have to be afraid is he says, you are with me. The sheep knows. The shepherd is with them. Again, even though I walk through the valley, God never says he's going to take you around the valley. He never says he's going to tunnel you under the valley. He never says, I'm going to fly you over that dark valley. We're going to walk through it. You're going to walk through it. You're going to go right smack dab in the middle of it. But the point is, you don't go by yourself. God says, I will go with with you through that valley. And he says, in essence, just, just all you have to do is take my hand and let me lead you. You know, I think another example with, with children is when there's darkness 
You know, a child could be standing at the end of a hallway and it's dark and they don't want to go down there. They don't want to go to their room because they don't want to walk down a dark hallway. You know, all it takes sometimes is a parent to do this and the child takes their hand and now guess what? The child has confidence to do what? Walk down that dark hallway. That's all it takes. The circumstances hasn't changed. You're still going to walk down that dark hallway. But the difference is you're not going alone. The difference is you don't have the parent saying, go, pushing them along. Go, just go. The parent is there, reaches down, grabs their hand, and let's go together. And that is what Jesus says to us. Take my hand and let me lead you. He also says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The emphasis in that phrase is not on the rod and the staff. That really has nothing to do with it. The emphasis is in the phrase on your rod and on your staff. You see, the confidence of the sheep come from the fact that not just the shepherd has a rod and a staff, but that the shepherd is the Lord. And the rod and the staff are in the hand of the one that we can trust. He is our shepherd. And again, we don't have to be afraid of the darkness. But then he says in verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Sheep have to eat. Just like everything else. Sheep have to eat. The fact is, that's about all they do. <laughs> when you see sheep, all they're doing is just eating the grass. They're not doing much of anything else. Uh, and feeding them, making sure they're fed, is the shepherd's job. That's what he does. And it's a full-time position. It is a full-time job. You spend all day with these sheep. And so shepherds must constantly watch the fields in which the flocks are going to graze to make sure that the grass remains green and that it's nourishing for them. But notice he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. A new shepherd just does not turn his flock into a new pasture without first walking in front of them and looking ahead to make sure it's safe. The shepherd knows what the sheep don't know. And that is, the grass is green, but it doesn't mean that there are not some dangers out there. It looks good, but there's some dangers. You got different types of poisonous plants that might be out there. You've got venomous snakes that could be out there. You've got wolves that could be out there. And so the shepherd goes on ahead to make sure everything is safe. He walks out in front, carefully surveys everything to make sure his sheep are going to be safe. And then he says in verse 5, again, you have anointed my head with oil. Perhaps one of the greatest enemies of sheep, or any livestock for that matter, is flies and insects. It just, they fly around their head and it, it drives them insane. Just like it drives us insane. And so sheep can, be so, can become so irritated by the insects that, around their face that they become restless. And they get so caught up that they actually stop eating because they're so annoyed. They won't eat anymore. They stop grazing. Cattle are like that. That's why you have to put some things on, on, on the cattle's head to keep the flies and insects off, because if you don't, they'll stop eating. And so the shepherd, seeing the situation, seeing his sheep, applies oil to the head and around the face area of the sheep. And again, that is to keep those pests away. Oil, again, is still used today for sheep to keep the insects and flies away. You may say, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, unless I missed my guess, I bet I could go to each and every one of you and you could tell me somebody, someone in your life that just bugs the living daylights out of you, that irritates you. I think we can. I, there's people in my life that they, they just irritate me. And so what do you do when people bug you? What do you do when people irritate you? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You just turn them over to the shepherd. Let him deal with it. You turn them over to the shepherd. And through the oil of the shepherd's counsel 
And through the oil of the shepherd's word and the oil that comes to us through prayer, he calms our souls. He relaxes us. He anoints us with the oil of peace. He says, you have anointed my head with oil. And then he says, my cup overflows. The shepherd provides water. In the days of summer drought, the shepherd must work even harder to keep his flock water. And that's not an easy task. There's a quote about this, and I'll, I'll read it real quick. It says, sometimes the shepherd had to find a very deep well from which to draw water for his flock. Some of these wells would be 100 feet down. To draw the water, the shepherd would have to use a long rope with a bucket at the end. The bucket would hold maybe three quarts. It had to be let down and drawn up by hand over and over and over again, and the water poured into large stone cups that he would set beside the well. It was a long process. If a shepherd had 100 sheep, he would probably have to draw for two hours if he allowed the sheep to drink all that they wanted. That's a lot of work. Imagine drawing water from a well for two hours by hand. That's tough. That's a lot of work. But that's what he was willing to do. And so the sheep looks at his shepherd and they say, my cup overflows. We're so good at counting our problems. We're so good. We can name all of our problems and, and the issues that we have in our life but we forget about the blessings. We, we sing the song, count your blessings. I dare say that our blessings outnumber our troubles. The truth of the matter is that sheep looked at the shepherd and the care that the shepherd provided and said, my cup overflows. Well, so do ours. Ours overflow as well. And so he says at the end, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. There's contentment there. You see contentment in that passage. And so, being content. Paul said he had to learn to be content. And that's what I see in that passage. We're out of time. Um, but go through, I, I encourage you to go through the rest of Psalm 23 and look at it from a deeper perspective. Look at it from the sheep's point of view. And you can see yourself in Psalm 23. And you can see what the shepherd is doing. For us. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and conclude there. And again, Caleb is supposed to be back on Wednesday. Uh, if he's not, I may just pick up there and then we'll move into something else. Uh, we'll just, I guess, take one day at a time.